so. Okay, so we are recording. All right. Um, we had a good question, and the question was, how do we do a split front um, applique on like a full zip hoodie or something similar with pre-digitized letters, like Stahl's letters, um, you know, and they, they are pre-done for applique. Typically with a full zip or, you know, anything that, um, you know, might have a seam in the middle uh, where you cannot stitch over that seam. Um, basically what you'll do is you will take the, uh, the sweatshirt or, you know, the jacket and zip it up um, and hoop it with the zipper and hoop it completely uh, for all the letters. And you just need to make sure that you have a wide enough space between your lettering um, uh, for that zipper. And I actually do have a, a picture here. If you just give me a second, uh, let me look for that and I'll show you uh, what I mean. Um, basically, we wouldn't do it in two separate designs. We would actually do it in one design, but in between the middle of the lettering, we'd have a larger space. Um, so again, let me find, um, and I have to apologize because I don't know exactly where it is off the top of my head. Let's see. So um, again, I'm looking for that that image, but you would take the completed, or I'm sorry, the <laughs> the sweatshirt that is zipped up all the way, and then make sure you have enough space in between the zipper because you cannot stitch on that zipper. You can't stitch on the edge of that zipper either. If it's um, if it is a split front jersey, that's a little bit different because they do space out the buttons so that you can uh, stitch all the way to the edge. But for something like that, something like this that you're asking about, uh, you would not do that. So let's go ahead. And it looks like I found my presentation, um, or at least one of the presentations. Here we go. Okay, so here is uh, an image of how we would hoop for the split front on a zippered good. Um, so you can see here it is zipped all the way up. It is hooped straight and you do have to make sure that you do have enough space on either side of the zipper so that you do not stitch on that zipper. If you stitch, if you try to stitch on that zipper, you're going to have um, needle breaks and whatnot. So the big thing is here is to measure uh, the width of your zipper, number one, and then to measure uh, what you need is like a little bit of a margin there to make sure that you're not going to run into it. You know, make sure that your uh, needle or your presser foot are not going to run into it um, and, and, and break anything. So um, this is a design that was actually done by Stalls, and it looks like the uh, origin point is a little bit off here. That's a little offset, but you could have it in the center if you want. You know, there's no problem with that. Um, it is nice to have it a little bit off because it is on that uh, placket right there. Um, let's go ahead and zoom in a little bit on this. Oh, that's just that. Oh, how do I go into presenter view? Anyway, um, you do have that little, um, there's that zoom. Sorry, guys. Um, you know, you can measure uh, that placket right there. And you can see that there's the origin point there. But again, it's okay if you have it right in the center, you know, that's going to uh, 
you know, be in the center of your design and then, you know, make sure again that you have enough space. So that's kind of the big thing there. Um, when you are in IDS, you can uh, change your uh, spacing on your grid and you could utilize that to, um, you know, reflect the spacing that you need across the lettering. Um, and, you know, you, you do want to make sure that you, you know, do it in the center of the design. You don't want to try and do it, you know, to, if you have a six letter word, you don't want to do two letters and then four letters. So just trying to do it in the center of the design. Um, so I hope that helps answer that question. Um, if you have a follow-up question to that, please let me know. Um, let's go ahead and look at it. So Denise, if you do need, you know, uh, more of a follow-up on that, please let me know. Or if you have something that you would like to do specifically, I'm certainly happy to help you out with it, even make a video and even post that on our YouTube channel. Um, so it looks like we've got, you know, a few people, a few more people in here. So again, thanks for coming. And um, what we're going to start out with today is um, we're going to start out with images and how images are not created equal. Um, images uh, that we do get for digitizing can be all over the board. They can be great images and they can be not so great images. Um, a lot of times we do get images like JPEGs and um, JPEGs are nice because they are easy to uh, email, they're smaller file size images, and um, it's just very common uh, in our, our, you know, in, in working now. Um, so, you know, uh, JPEGs is typically what we do get. And hold on a second, I'm going to, um, I looked at that question pane, sorry. Um, all right, so Denise, again, if you do need more help, just email me. Um, and if you need, you know, uh, more direction on those letters and how to import them and, and lay them out, I'm, I'm certainly happy to help you. Um, anyway, so, so JPEG images, um, they are easy to, to get, you know, from people. Um, but along with JPEGs, they're not perfect because JPEGs tend to have extra color information and um, they have more pixels and more color that are embedded in the design so that the image actually looks better when looking at it. They, um, you know, maybe looking at it as a small size or anything like that. Uh, they also load up quickly for um, for websites. So a lot of times uh, on websites, you're not using, you know, really high quality images, um, high resolution or anything like that. And you don't necessarily need high resolution images here in the program. You just need clean artwork. But again, we don't always get clean artwork. So um, I pulled a couple images off the internet this morning and um, we are going to go, I'm going to show you kind of some differences, Oop, we don't want that, um, some differences that we do see. So this image right here, it's just a black and white, and um, it looks very, very simple. But a lot of times what happens is that when we, um, when we do look at these images a little bit closer, which I'm just opening this in paint, you can see how messy it actually is. You can see there's a lot of extra gray, um, even zooming in close, closer and closer. Uh, on these edges, there's a ton of different color here. There's a lot of pixels that are, you know, all different shades of gray. Um, so when we get images like this, the program likes to read all those colors because the program is based on color recognition. So when it does read in these colors, it's going to try and read in all those different grays as well as the solid black here. Um, so again, it is a simple piece of artwork, but 
you know, really in actuality, it's it's very complex because it does have all these extra, you know, garbled uh, areas in here. You can see even, you know, kind of in a sense, the dirt, uh, if you will, uh, in that area. There are ways to kind of clean it up and to uh, tell the program only read certain colors of the design. So we are going to go in here and we are going to go to uh, the insert image. Now that is on the right hand side here with a little canvas or you can go up to create and then insert image. The shortcut key is also control I and I'm just left clicking on insert image and when we click on insert image here is the directory that I am looking in. Uh, you can see at the top the current directory showing me that I am on the desktop. Uh, on the left hand side you do have your different folders, your folder tree and this is where you can go in and um, navigate through your computer to see where your design is located. So again I just downloaded these to the desktop. I'm going to choose this image right here, left click on it and press OK. Once I press OK it does bring it in as a scanned image. There are times that I do bring in images uh, in, in different ways and in, in different techniques um, because of how the program works. Again I told you that the program is based on color recognition. It does try to clean up the image as best as possible and sometimes it will will do a great job and sometimes it you know, picks up all those little small colors. The first thing I'd like to try is just the simple artwork. I just want to see how it does. And actually, I haven't even tried this yet. So you guys are all experiencing the same thing that I am going to see. And I'm going to bring it in as simple artwork when I do so. So I just left clicked inside the little button here on simple artwork. I'll press OK. And it does bring in the size. It's about 90 millimeters, which is about the size of a left chest logo. Press OK again. And actually, it looks like it did a pretty darn good job. Um, I'll hit Go here. And it looks like it only picked up the black, but it also picked up the gray interior here. There's that little gray here. And I can always select it. And I just left clicked on that frame here. And I can just do a Control Delete on my keyboard. So I held down the Control key and then hit Delete on my keyboard. So it actually looks like it did a very nice job of um, handling this extra color information. I'm just going to right click off to the side. I clicked on my view outline so we could see our um, our rendering. Um, I'm sorry, not the rendering, but the uh, outlines that the program made or the, what the program drew for us, as well as the picture here. So you can see that it actually cleaned up all those little itty bitty areas. Um, so surprisingly it did do a pretty good job. We're going to go to a new design and I'm going to go to the right hand side and left click on insert image. I left click here. Again I'm going to choose the telegram logo and press OK. And this time we'll leave it as scanned image. And I'll go ahead and press OK again. And it actually does a very nice job here in cleaning it up. Now I want to show you what the thresh does here, but you can see here there's that little gray piece. Thresh goes between 0 and 100, and that's going to be the percentage of pixels and how many, you know, it's going to pick up more or less pixels. So if I take that thresh and highlight it, um, and I bring that down to maybe 5, and then hit apply, it will recalculate and go through that. Now this is a more simple image so um, it's not really doing too much, it's not really getting, uh, you know, throwing away too much. Um, and then by the way at the top here, here is our original view and here is our simplified view. So simplified view is what IDS is tracing. This is what the stitches would, you know, follow. So let's say I go up now to 85 and then hit apply, it's going to pick up more pixels. So you see now it's picking up all those different um, gray areas and you can see too that it made that outline a little bit more jagged because it's reading the image in a sense a little bit better. It's, it's getting further in there. Um, this is not necessarily what we would want though. 
Um, so if we even bring it up further, let's go ahead and hit apply. You can see it's it's bringing in more and it's getting closer to that image, you know, uh, of what the image actually is. But again, we don't necessarily want that. So I'm going to bring that back down to 15 and hit apply. Um, we can hit this edit button right here, which actually allows us to go into the image editor. Uh, I'm not going to go over that right now. I'm actually going to continue and again, OK. And it looks like, you know, it, it read it pretty much similar to what Simple Artwork did. Uh, and it is reading that gray area. Let's go to insert image or new design again. And we are going to go to the insert image and we're going to take that logo again but this time um, i'm going to bring it in a simple artwork and i'm going to deselect this auto select auto select will read all the colors that it sees you know automatically if i deselect here which this uh, i use this quite a bit with jpeg images and images that have a lot of extra color information if i deselect this auto select and i go to pick color I am now telling the program what colors to actually read. So I'm going to left click on the white. You can see my little eyedropper here. Um, as I move over the different colors, you can see the actual color box change at the bottom here. So I'm going to move over the white and left click, and then I'm going to move over the black and left click. So I'm saying only read these two colors. When I do that, it will simplify the artwork even more. Press OK. It'll say only read two colors, and I do need that white because the white background. If I only selected the black, I'd just get a big black box. So I'll go ahead and press OK. Um, press OK again, and now I'll hit go. And you can see now it did not do that white, or I'm sorry, that gray. Um, so I can see here, if I turn off that background image, that is what it is reading. Now, of course, um, I can do some cleanup on here. Uh, I can change the stitch types and whatnot. But really here what I wanted to show you is, is using these tools. Let's go to another design. We'll go to a new design. Uh, I haven't yet tried this design. I forgot that I had it, but I'll go to insert image. This is an image that I took a screenshot of, um, this performance image. I'll go ahead and press OK and it is reading it as a scanned image. Um, I am going to change it to simple artwork and let's just see how it brings it in as simple artwork, no changes. Press OK and OK again. And you can see, I'm just gonna even make that a little bit bigger so we can actually see it. But you can see all those different areas that the program is reading. You can see all those different colors in here. Um, you can see all these different extra pieces and you can certainly see that this is not uh, polished by any means. So uh, let's see how we can improve it. So again, sometimes I do go through this several times um, to see what the best way is to bring it in. Um, so I'll go to new design, I'll go to insert image on the right hand side. And here I will go ahead and choose that design again press OK. Now let's just see what the scanned image has to say. We'll go ahead and press OK. And you can see that it is kind of reading it, you know, not so great. You can see where this image um, might have some issues, you know, especially right here. Um, simplified and original, it's, you know, quite, uh, quite different. So we'll hit, uh, We'll hit cancel because I, I can see how that's going to go. Um, let's go to insert image again. We'll go to the M performance, press OK. And this time we'll do simple artwork. We'll deselect the auto select, go to pick color, and I am going to choose black and white. And press OK. Press OK again. And let's make that a little bit bigger. That's quite small. As far this actually goes on car mats, um, so we'll go ahead and uh, take that to about 18 on the Y. Uh, it might be a little bit long, but 
uh, let's see how it does. Press OK. You know, I can always change uh, that size. So you can see that it actually does come in, you know, better than it did over here. Um, it still needs some help for sure, uh, but uh, you can see that by selecting just the colors that it needed, um, it didn't bring in all that extra color information on the left-hand side here. Um, another thing um, that I like to use sometimes is uh, the magic wand or the semi-automatic tool. So here I'm going to go to insert image. I'm going to choose this design, press OK. And instead of a simple artwork or scanned image, I'm going to bring it in as a template. And in bringing it in as a template, it's only bringing it in as an image. It's not going to retrace anything. So we'll go ahead and press OK here. And once we press OK, again, I'll change this to, let's go to 16 this time. And press OK. And you can see, as we zoom in, see all that extra color information? It's really not that sharp. Uh, it is a small resolution. Again, I took a screenshot of it. So, a, you know, a screenshot is very low DPI. It, again, it's not very sharp here. So, you know, from from this to what it did automatically is, is not too bad. Um, again, the other tool that sometimes I like to use, and again, it all depends on the image itself, is this magic wand over here and it's right above the go button and when I left click on it my cursor turns into a crosshair and I have to kind of point and click over the area I would like the program to read and trace for me. So if I go over this M and I usually want to go over kind of more of a solid area uh, I don't want to go over this this light gray here because you know that's not really what I want so I go over the solid area and left click when I left click, it's taking a little sample of that and it's reading a little bit of the color. And you can see I have a tolerance box here, a tolerance of color and a tolerance of noise. Typically, I move the tolerance of color and I don't really have to move it much. You can see here that as I move it just a little bit, it read more of that color. Um, so as I move it more and more, it's going to read more and more of that color. And you can see that as I move it even up further, it's starting to connect things because it's taking more sampling of that. Um, so typically with something like this, I am, you know, using this color tolerance. When I have areas maybe inside the M that have holes or, uh, you know, maybe some some color pixels in here that are creating holes, that's when I increase the noise. The noise kind of picks up that dirt and, um, and merges it with it. Um, so as soon as I hit OK, it then puts in stitching into the area that it traced. Now I am still in the tool, and the next one that I go to, if I left click on it, it actually will keep those same, um, you know, same settings that I had before. So, you know, I can increase, I can decrease, and, um, you know, kind of play around with the different settings. Once I'm happy, I can hit OK. Again, um, you probably need to go in here and do some changes to it, such as, you know, uh, the edit outline mode and the, uh, basically, the outline uh, view going in there and changing things around. But that's another way that I can go in and get images that are maybe not so great because they do have a lot of extra color information. Um, PNGs also tend to be problematic because of just all the extra pixels in there. Um, so in order to get out of the tool, I'm gonna hit escape. Um, I think the next se session we will go over more of these problem images, but I have been getting a lot of questions about that. And um, this is a good way to um, kind of clean up those images before they come in. So um, anyway, we'll go ahead and close these out. Um, if you do have questions, 
you know, please, please let me know. Um, go ahead and close all these guys out. And if anybody has a logo that they want to, you know, send to me and say, hey, I'd like to see this in the webinar, um, that would be great. You know, it's kind of real life situations uh, that that we want to see um, in digitizing. So I'm going to go to a new design and we're going to talk a bit about applique. Uh, let me close out a couple of these items here. And in applique, um, applique is a, a pretty big thing, uh, especially in collegiate uh, high school, you know, any sort of team sports um, and even the fun boutique type of personalization um, using applique uh, it can help us out quite a bit. Um, not only keeping up with the trends and things like that, but also, you know, let's say you're doing a large design, um, we can use applique for large fill, which otherwise might be large fill areas. Um, we can also utilize applique in making patches. Uh, I know a lot of people who are using it, the applique method, uh, when they are making a patch, maybe for like a motorcycle club, rather than putting all the stitches onto a leather jacket or just, you know, in a jacket in general, um, you know, you're making all those needle points. Instead of doing that, you're doing it on an applique uh, or t doing it on a twill, finishing off the edges with satin stitching and then applying that to the um, to, you know, to the, the finished garment or even applicating it onto the finished garment. Um, again, I'll use the example of a motorcycle club. They do like to use patches for their jackets because sometimes they change the style of their patch or maybe they want to, they, they'll do a commemorative year um, so that they, you know, it's easy for them to uh, tear away the the running stitch patch or you know a sewing stitch straight stitch um, rather than having to buy and redo a whole new jacket um, I actually ran into a person who was doing uh, sh she rides a motorcycle and she does a lot of uh, work for the Red Cross and she uh, sometimes will have people that she's going to help and they get a little skittish because she is coming up on a loud motorcycle. So what she has done is she made a big patch, a big red cross patch um, that she puts on the back of her jackets that she wears. So, you know, in the summertime, she might wear a different jacket than her, her winter jacket. So, you know, patches are, are kind of versatile in, in that sense. Um, but, you know, utilizing applique, you can utilize the edging or the satin stitch edging as to kind of mimic a, the, the edging of a patch. Um, so applique is, is used in many different techniques um, from, you know, regular applique to patch making to, um, um, what was the other thing I was going to say? I apologize. Again, I'm getting over being sick. So uh, if I lose my words, I apologize. Um, oh, the other thing was, um, you know, kind of cutting down on, on stitch count, you know, for large backgrounds. And there's even some cool fabrics out there that kind of mimic stitching. Um, so it kind of looks, it gives it that look of a stitch fill. Uh, there's a lot of cool you know, textiles out there that we can utilize in um, embroidery uh, applique. So applique, let's start off, it's, it's a three-step process. And the three steps are a placement stitch, a tack down stitch, and a cover stitch. So give me a second, I'm gonna pull up an applique design. Um, let's see. And I apologize, I'm looking through my computer, so I paused my screen um, so you guys can't see how much of a mess I am. I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> I've got quite a few uh, designs, so 
If you just give me a second, let's actually we'll go ahead and import. Um, we'll go ahead and import a, a DST file from. I believe I have this in my stalls. Okay, and actually this this is showing us, so this is a, a two-step process. A lot of times people will do the two-step process if they have designs that are already pre-cut um, or, or the fabric is pre-cut. Um, there's also the three-step process. The three-step process is uh, obviously one more step, but it helps if you don't have a cutter or that if you are, um, you know, cutting on the machine. Um, that three, you, you definitely need the three-step process. The two-step process here uh, that we see is a placement stitch and then a cover stitch. So what we see on screen um, is that cover stitch or that finishing edge of the circle here. I'm going to turn it invisible. And in order to turn it invisible, I just left-click on this eyeball right here. And now you can see this running stitch here, which is our placement stitch. I'm going to zoom in on the the whole design. And here you see the placement stitch is just a running stitch. Typically, our placement stitch is going to be the shape and exact size of the um, fabric that we are putting down. And this is just, you know, typically a single run. And this will stitch down on your, you know, garment uh, before you put any fabric down. So th what you'll do when you hoop up your garment, uh, you'll hoop it up just like you would with any other design. Uh, show where you want, you know, you, you line it up to where you want that applique to be. And then the first stitch that goes down is showing you where to place the fabric. So again, you don't put any fabric down to, on top of your garment. Uh, you'll do your first set of stitching, which is your placement stitch. And then typically we have a color change. So with the color change, you can see that here, and you can see that also on the left-hand side here. You've got a, you know, a dark brown and then kind of an orange. So you have a color change, and that color change um, is actually is seen as a stop on the machine. Um, when you are inputting it into your machine, uh, you know, inputting the design into your machine, you will see that the design may be two or three colors, but really it's all one color and you just have to make sure that the stops are input correctly. So um, it does the placement stitch, then you have a color change, and so the machine will stop. So after the placement stitch, the machine stops, you take your fabric. Now, in this instance, it's probably pre-cut because the next step is the finishing stitch or the cover stitch. You'll spray a little tack, um, uh, spray, I'm sorry, glue tack on it, and um, it'll just enough to get that to adhere to the fabric. So there's that spray glue that you can get. Make sure you spray away from your machine. Um, make sure that you know you're you're not spraying it too much. You don't want to gum up the needles or anything like that. Um, but you want to spray it enough to where it kind of holds down onto the material. After you put that down on the material, uh, you'll start up the machine again. So again, this is something that that has a um, a pre-cut uh, shape. Then it will stitch that second um, step, which is the cover stitch or the final stitch. Um, when you do have something like this, um, it is going to overlap the placement stitch, you know, because you don't want to see your placement stitch, and it's going to make sure to uh, secure that fabric onto your garment. Now, the three step process typically has, you know, a step in between one and two, and that would be a tack down stitch. So let's say you don't have a 
um, pre-cut piece of fabric in that shape and size. You just have a piece of fabric that is about the, the size, you know, a little bit bigger than the size of your design. Uh, you can, after the placement stitch goes down, you then, again, you'll, you'll spray that fabric with just a little bit of glue and put that down. And then the second step that starts stitching would be a tack down stitch. Typically the tack down stitch goes a little bit to the interior of the placement stitch and it will tack down the fabric and that is another color. So in, if you were to have the three step process in this design, you would actually have three colors. So um, after that second step stitches, the machine will stop and then you can cut away the excess fabric. Um, after that, then it will do the cover stitch. So we have a couple of ways that we can do applique in this program. We can do it automatically and we can also do it manually. Doing it manually, you have a little bit more control. Uh, doing it automatically is kind of a nice, quick, fast way to do this. With applique, um, typically your cover stitch or your satin stitch that goes on top is about four millimeters. Um, and your tack down stitch um, is either a running stitch or a loose zigzag stitch. And your uh, placement stitch is typically a running stitch. So it looks like we have a quick question here. So question is, um, the process of putting it into the machine. And yes, um, I will, I can describe that uh, when we create a design. So absolutely. We also have a video on how to input stops on the machine, um, but we're actually working on a video on how to do uh, applique on the ZSK. Um, we, we do have some other ones out there with stalls um, that we've done on, on applique as well. They've got some cool fabric for applique. And, you know, another thing with applique, they have come out with some really uh, cool materials that allow you to rip away the excess material rather than cut. Now, you can't really do that with twill or anything like that, but, you know, there's glitter material, there's flock material, um, and, and there's other types of vinyls that you can, um, that you can stitch and then rip away. Uh, so you, there's no need for a cutter. There's no need for, um, you know, pre-cutting the design or anything like that. Although I will um, kind of before we get into this, um, this placement stitch, again, it is the shape and size of what you want to applique. So sometimes what you can do is print this out on your worksheet and just use this as your um, as your template for cutting. So if we go, and I'm just going to take this second piece and delete it. And then I'm going to show you in a print preview. Our next, our second page is a 100% design template. So we could actually take this, print it out, and um, this is my placement stitch and use that as a template in cutting my material. Now this is a circle, so it doesn't matter if it's forwards or backwards, but you know, if you are doing, um, you know, letters, if you're tracing it onto the fabric, typically I trace the, um, the backside of the fabric. So you need to make sure that you're inverting that, um, that image. So, I will use the, um, if you don't, you know, have access to a printer, or I'm sorry, to a cutter, um, or you don't have pre-cut, uh, you know, shapes, um, you can print this out, you know, cut this out on your paper, and then trace it onto your fabric. I'm kind of a fan of this, using this technique, because you're not cutting on the hoop. Um, and in cutting on the hoop, you can potentially uh, loosen up your garment on the hoop and, you know, it can 
kind of, uh, you know, make that garment not register properly when you have that uh, it, that um, fabric on there. Um, so I do kind of like this technique uh, in just using the placement stitch. Now, if you are designing your, uh, you know, your uh, applique piece in, you know, Corel or Illustrator, you can certainly use that too um, as your, um, you know, as your template. Okay, so let's go to a new design. And I'm going to show you kind of how we can digitize this automatically and manually. So I'm going to do a letter. And um, with lettering, um, you know, it does come in as a satin stitch. So over on the right-hand side here, I'm going to go to Insert Text. And in Insert Text, um, I'm going to go ahead and type in... Um, we're going to type in the letter Z. I'm going to highlight it. We are going to change the font. And I just downloaded a collegiate font. And usually with lettering, we have it a bit larger. So I'm going to go to almost about four inches. I'll do 95. We can bold our lettering too. Um, this is kind of more of a simple shape. Um, I just kind of wanted to show you how we would do something like, you know, something simple. So we'll go ahead and press OK. And when we press OK, there's our letter. There's our outline of the letter. We'll go ahead and hit go. And it does bring it in as a satin stitch. Now, when I right click on the area, um, when we look at it, Instead of the stitching, we're looking at this being the fabric. So the um, the applique is going to go on that blue and white flashing line. If we go to the outline view up here at the top, it's going to be the black outline. So that's where our applique lines are going to follow, you know, uh, that outline right there. So let's go back to the stitch view. And in the stitch view, with it right-click selected, I'm going to hit my space bar, or I can click on the uh, property settings here. By hitting space bar, it's just a quick way to get your property settings with the area right-click selected. I'm going to scroll over here, and I have the applique. This is the automatic applique. I'm just going to actually move this over so we can see what happens when we apply it. So as I hit apply, you'll notice that the interior is no longer stitched. That would be what we see as fabric. We also have the um, satin stitch outline here. And we also have on the left-hand side, we actually have one frame that has three uh, little steps in it. Those three steps are within the applique tab. Within the applique tab, um, I'm just going to deselect tack down and cover stitch so we can see, I'll hit apply here, so we can actually see what the placement stitch is. The placement stitch, it was kind of hard to, it, we saw it for just a second when we hit the apply button. Um, but what it is, is a, a running stitch that is on this blue and white flashing line. That is the exact shape and size of the fabric that we want applicate onto our garment. So the blue and white flashing line as the border, the offset is at zero. With the offset at zero, again, it's fitting right on that blue and white flashing line. Your maximum and minimum lengths have to do with your stitch lengths on your, um, on your running stitch. Again, this is just a running stitch. But one thing that is a side note, um, it, if we go to the line tab here, the maximum step here says six, and I do not like this as a maximum step. I'm going to change that to 2.5, and I'm going to save that. When I hit save, it asks me where um, or what stitch property I want to save it as, and um, it, it, it usually goes to the 
correct stitch property, but I'm sure I've done something fun in here. Um, so that's under my SuperTech folder, under IDS, and that would be under Properties. And Properties, I'm just going to save it under Default. And hit Save. And I do want to replace it. So now my maximum step here is 2.5. Um, I encourage you to change it in the applique, just like I'm doing, and, and saving that. Um, so your maximum stitch length is 2.5, and your minimum is 1. I'll press OK. Now I'm going to right-click off to the side here, and this is my placement stitch. So that's the offset at 0. And then um, let's go ahead and zoom the whole design. Offset at zero, minimum and maximum step at 2.5 and 1.0. If I'd like to see my needle penetrations, I can left click up here at the top and you can see those needle penetrations. I just want to show you um, what would happen with that being at six, the line, the maximum step being at six. If I apply that, my stitch lengths get really long and I don't really like that um, because it's too long, it's too loose for, in my opinion, for that um, for that applique. So let's change it back to 2.5 and apply. And once you do save it in the default, it will always go to the 2.5 for the applique because all we're doing is changing it here in applique. So let's go back to applique and then we have a tack down stitch. The tack down stitch is going to be the second step of uh, after the placement stitch goes, again, you'll stop the machine, uh, you'll lay down your fabric, and then you'll start the machine again. With the tack down stitch, um, you want it a little bit to the inside of the original line here uh, to tack down your fabric. And um, with an offset of negative one, it's going to you know, fall just to the interior here of the balloon white flashing line. Again, your minimum and maximum step uh, here is 2.5 and 1. It's still here 2.5. You know, we only had to change it one time. Here where it says need not cut cloth, if that's check marked, it will not put in a color change and it will automatically go to the cover stitch. I typically don't select this um, because I do like to check and make sure that the fabric is uh, is down properly and is tacked down properly uh, before doing the cover stitch because if there is any problem with it I'd rather catch it now than after the satin stitch goes on top of it. So your tack down stitch will tack it down again with a running stitch. At the negative one if I hit apply it's putting it just to the interior here so negative one millimeter. You'll see here too you have two um, Z's in the uh, in the frame, and when you export this file to the machine, it's actually going to take each step and make each step a different color. You don't see it on here on the IDS file, but we'll export it and import it back in, and then you'll see how that changes. Um, so, but if you do select this, this need not cut cloth, it will only have two color changes and not three, or I'm sorry, two colors and not three colors. So what we have here, um, we have an offset at negative one. With the offset at negative one, we have to make sure that our cover stitch is going to, you know, make sure and overlap that. So with the cover stitch, if I check mark that, the offset is at negative two here. So it's going to sit inside this blue and white flashing line, negative two millimeters. It's gonna create that line there. But the width is four millimeters. So from that line, it's going to, uh, from the center, um, space out two millimeters on each side. So at negative two millimeters, the line will probably go here, and then two millimeters this way, and two millimeters that way. So if I hit apply here, you'll see that it just, let's go ahead and turn off this, whoops, we'll press okay and turn this off. 
we'll go ahead and zoom in here it's just overlapping a little bit here and the reason is is because that uh, that line for your cover stitch is here and then it's going two millimeters this way and two millimeters that way so it's splitting it in the middle let's go ahead and zoom that whole design again we'll go back to our settings and in our settings we'll go back to the applique tab so if I don't want the stitching to come in as far uh, or I want it to you know to overlap this a little bit more which I would uh, recommend because your placement stitch is right on the edge and you might have some you know edges of your fabric there I might change that offset I'm going to change it to negative one so instead of moving it inside negative two it's only going to move it inside negative one so now I will have one millimeter kind of on the outside of the Z here and three millimeters on the inside so if I hit apply oh, negative one apply now you can see more is going to the outside and now it's still covering that tack down stitch too um, so you do want to make sure that that tack down stitch is going to be covered if I take the offset at zero it moves it even further outside because it's now doing it at the zero point and I should get half of the satin stitch on one side and half of the satin stitch on the other side and it is still covering that negative offset for the tack down because you've got two millimeters on this side um, now if we start to do something where it's positive let's say I do a positive offset of two and hit apply you're gonna you you'll then see the tack down stitch and now it's completely to the outside so you have to make sure that your offset is going to fall in line with your tack down stitch now you also have the width here if you have again the width is typically about four millimeters um, you can do wider or you can do thinner now when you're doing thinner you know just make sure that you're doing it enough to where it's going to hold that material down so let's say I do two I'll hit apply now it's going to be thinner and it's just barely covering that um, you know that tack down stitch so you need to make sure that either the width is you know wide enough to cover that tack down stitch or your offset is uh, in the proper position so you know maybe I want to do 2.75 have a little bit more I can hit apply you can also go in and change pull compensation which will extend that stitches those stitches even more but it is important to know you know your width your offsets um, and of your three different steps so I'll hit apply here now you can use different things with the cover stitch you could also use a blanket stitch and typically with a blanket stitch I'll go ahead and hit apply here you do not use a tack down stitch um, because the tack down will be seen underneath the blanket stitch you can do the tack down it's really all on what you want to do um, the blanket stitch settings are here at the top you have the ability to do different types of um, stitch directions in your blanket stitch you could have it just on the right side of the line on the left side of the line or on both sides so let's say I do it on the left side of the line it really won't tack it down uh, because it's going to do it on the outside um, I can do it on both sides and hit apply here and I can do it you know both sides this is this is not a zigzag but this is more of a a sat or I'm sorry a blanket stitch um, you also have the ability to change the step as well as the branch height the step is going to be the spacing in between each um, you know each blanket uh, extension if you will let's go ahead and let's apply this whoops wrong side so if I do a larger step and apply it it's going to have greater space between the blanket stitches the branch height I can change and this is going to be how long these guys are 
Um, let's say I do five as well. I'll hit apply. Now you have to realize that this is going five millimeters, so it's going to be pretty high. Um, so your step length, you know, typically two to three is what I see. Um, and then, you know, two to three, let's do 2.5 here, and I'll apply that. Now you also have the branch angles, and since we have a right direction, we can uh, change it here. Let's do 130, apply that. Oh, maybe it's the left one here. I guess it's the left one. Um, so we can apply that, and um, now you have a, a branch direction. Um, the branch offsets are going to be for something if it's double. So you can have the offset of the left and the right and apply it, and you can see, you know, this is kind of a baseball look. It's kind of cool. Um, so, you know, you can do different angles um, on either side on how you want that to look. So there's going to be some fun things that you can play with with the blanket stitch. Um, but let's go back to applique and just use a satin stitch and apply that. So it looks like we did have a question here. Um, so st stabilizer or backing that we use um, for the different applications, it really all depends on what you're stitching, you know, what kind of garment you're stitching on, and how many stitches are in the actual design. You know, there are designs that are tackle twill that have a very open satin stitch um, or, you know, open zigzag stitch, and you don't necessarily need a lot of uh, stabilizer on there because it is, you know, an open stitch. So you could use like a, a tearaway if you want. Um, if you have a, a dense satin stitch and it has a lot of stitching, you know, maybe you have a really long word or you just have a lot of stitching, you know, you might want to use a cutaway. Um, you also have to look at the fabric that you're stitching on. Um, if the fabric is uh, not so stable, the more stability you need. The more stable your fabric is, you know, the less stability in a sense for, for backing that you need. So you know, it, there's not one answer to what kind of backing you do use. You have to look at all the different uh, pieces of the, the puzzle um, to come up with a good, uh, good answer for that. Um, so again, it depends on how stable your material is, how many stitches you have, what you're actually doing on your material, so on and so forth. Um, so the way that I look at it too is that you know, look at how stable your fabric is that you're going to stitch on. If it's not very stable and very flimsy and, um, you know, like a performance um, type of material, you need more backing. And it could be that you're using, you know, several layer layers or you're using a heavier type of backing. You know, there's a lot of different things um, that go into the whole uh, you know, we call it the whole recipe. Uh, if you do have specific questions on, you know, different applications, I'm certainly happy to help you out. But a lot of it is going to be um, kind of experimentation and seeing, you know, how things uh, look with the different backings and even different stitch um, counts, different stitch types, you know, so on and so forth. So there's a lot that does go into it. Um, so I. I know I didn't answer your question directly, but I hope that helped. <laughs> so we'll go ahead and press OK here. So we see that with this letter, we have the three-step process. And um, with that, if we export it, let's if I go here and I go to save DST or EXP, and I'll go in, I'll, I'll save it to my desktop. Now, one thing here that I am going to say, uh, it's, it's a little different. Let's go ahead and save it, z.dst. If I take this over to my machine, it will automatically bring it over as three colors. Um, but one thing about this DST format, which is nice for regular logos because it brings in all the colors that it sees, is that it does attach, and I'll show you on my desktop, 
it does attach a RGB file to it, okay? DST and RGB. So when I do import it, it's going to import it with the colors or with the correct colors because as we all know, a lot of times when we import DST files, they will be brought in as funny colors. So let's go to new design. I will go to open DST or EXP and we will find the Z, press open, and it actually, this is good, it actually brought it in as three different blues. Um, sometimes it might bring it in as several, uh, or as the same blue, but three different pieces. So now you can see that they are different colors, so we can see the three different um, steps here. The other thing about this is that with the automatic applique, if we go and let's say, um, actually let's just do a new design. If I just go and type in ZSK and I press OK and I hit go and then we're going to change this to applique and I'm just going to have these as, you know, regular Oh, you know what? When I changed my line, I also had only tack or placement selected. So I need to go back in here and let's resave this default. Make sure tack down and cover is done. And I'll hit save. Go back to my super tech IDS and properties. Find default and hit save. Yes, I do. I'll apply that and OK. So with this, um, it's going to do Z placement tack down cover, S placement tack down cover, K placement tack down cover, which is not very efficient. Um, so with that, a lot of times what I like to do is I first export it. And let's say this as ZSK, hit save, and now I go to my new design and I will go and import it this time and we'll see ZSK, I'll open that, and now if you look here, some of it does not have color changes. Um, we can see between the K tack down and the K cover, there's not a color change. But that's okay for now. Um, but that uh, when you do import it with that RGB color attached or that file attached, it will try to import it as those, you know, as like colors as possible. So sometimes what I'll do is I'll take that RGB and I'll just throw it away. Oops. I'll just throw it away in my recycle bin. So then I'll go to a new design and open it. And now those colors are not attached to it. So we should have uh, color changes between each one except the outline and the uh, placement stitch. And the reason is, is because we didn't have color changes between Let's see. We didn't have color changes between here. If we did have color changes in between here, it would color change between the Z uh, cover stitch and the S placement stitch. So um, we'll come back here, and what we see is how it would stitch out on the machine. Z placement, Z cover. I'm sorry, Z <laughs> Z uh, tack down, and then Z cover. S placement, S tack down, S cover, you know, so on and so forth. So what I'd like to do here is move all the placements together, all the tack downs together, and all the covers together and have them only be three color changes. So I'm going to take the placement, left click on this one, hold my control key, left click on the S placement, and left click on the K placement. With those three selected, I let go of the control key, and now I will right click 
and I'll say move to bottom. So I'm just moving these all to the bottom. They all will stay in the ZSK um, order. You know, the Z will stitch first, the S will stitch second, and then the K will stitch third, but just at the bottom here. Then I will scroll up. I'll take the Z, and actually, while we're selected on them, you see how there's colors, changes between each one? What we'll do here is we will take this while they are three selected, go down to the color bar here, left click, and change it to a different color. I'm just going to change it to green and press OK. So now all three are the same color. There's no color changes in between of those, of those placements. Then I will take the tack down of the Z, so I left click here. Then I hold my control, left click on the S, and left click on the K. Let go of the control. I right click inside one of the frames that is selected and just move to bottom. Again, it will stay in that ZSK order, but then now move it underneath. So I'm just shifting everything down to the bottom. Now I want to change the color. I want to change it to something different than that green. And let's change it to blue and press OK. So now I've got the placement and then the tack down. And now let's take the cover stitches. So I left click on the Z, hold down the control key, S and K, let go of the control key, right click and say move to bottom. I then will change the color to a different color, press OK, right click off to the side. I'll recalculate my stitching. Um, I do want to put some trims in between here, and it looks like between the Z and S on the placement, it's correct. Um, I'll put a trim here and here and then here and here, so I don't have these long jump stitches. After I do that, then I can re-export it, and I'll just save it as ZSK. And hit save. I'll replace it and OK. So, excuse me. So, if you do do it, um, you know, all your letters with the automatic tool, you know, keep in mind that it's doing each one on each one um, in its own three step group. So, I do like to, you know, if you're doing more than one applique, um, export it and then import it back in. So, it looks like we had another question. Okay, so um, so I'm glad I helped with that uh, stabilizer slash backing question. Um, now let's talk about doing applique manually. And doing applique manually, um, we're basically creating three outlines. Um, so let's go ahead and go back to our lettering. And this time we'll do, you know, a different letter. I'll press OK and generate my stitches. So I'm going to zoom completely into the area. And um, while we are zoomed in, you can see that it is filled in with the satin stitch. I am going to, the satin stitch is going to stay here until I delete it um, because I need to make my three steps. And I need to utilize this area to make the three steps. So I will right click on the area to select it. And with it right click selected, you can see that it's got the blue and white flashing lines. Um, and I can actually do this step in any one of my um, views. Sometimes I do like to go to the view outline. And in the view outline, I can see you know, my shape a little bit better. So with it right click selected, I can right click again inside the area and scroll down to create outline from area edges. Again, this tool, is also available if I right click inside the area in my stitch view, create outline from area edges. So, you know, it is available in the different views. I'm going to right click, create outline from area edges, and in here I'm going to create the first border. So, this first border I am going to have as a run. I do want it on all borders because I have the inside of this D here. And the offset is zero. It's going to fit directly on that that line right there. It's going to be, you know, on the outline. So I'll go ahead and press OK. And once I press OK, 
it creates that outline. Now, it creates it as the same color that I'm working on. So if I hit go, you'll notice that I now have an outline as a running stitch in that blue. So I'm just going to change the color to a different color. So there's my placement stitch. I'm going to right click off to the side to deselect. And then I will right click inside the blue area again and create another outline. This time this outline will be designated for the tack down stitch. So I will, with it right click selected, I can right click again, create outline from area edges. When I left click on that, I can do another run stitch or maybe I want to do a double run. I want to do it on all borders and this time I need to change the offset to be negative so it fits inside the area. Um, with the offset, you do have to keep in mind what you want your cover with stitch, you know, what you want that to be. So you don't want to go too far inside. Um, we'll just do a negative one offset here and then press OK. Once I do that, it creates that outline. I am going to change the color before I generate the stitches. And we'll change it to a dark green. I'll press OK. I'll right click off to the side. And let's go ahead and turn this D invisible. So now um, I have the uh, the blue satin stitching, but I also have a placement stitch and then a tack down stitch. And um, you can see that you know the red is my placement and the the uh, green is my tack down. So now the final one, um, really with this one, I could actually copy and paste numbers two and three, um, or create a whole new outline. So I'm just going to right click on my D. I right click again inside the area. In right clicking inside the area after I've selected it once, it's the same as going up to your tools up here. Um, or, you know, if I go up to outline, it's the same as getting my tools. So I just right clicked in there create outline from area edges. I'm going to do a satin border on all the borders and I'm going to change my width to four. I'm going to leave the offset at zero and press OK. There is that third and final outline as a satin stitch and I'll hit go. And um, it is blue which is fine here. I'm just going to turn this area invisible and now you can see that I created the three-step process with those um, three outlines. Now sometimes um, I want to have a little bit more control over my satin stitch. This is a satin stitch on a line. Satin stitch on a line and satin stitch on an area are quite different um, in that you have control over the width of the satin stitch on a line. So like if you go to here uh, to your properties and then go to the line tab you can change your width, but on an area, it's constrained to the area. So if I wanted it wider, I could hit six here, apply that, and I could have a wider stitch. Um, whereas on, a, on an area, it, like I said, it's constrained to the actual area itself. Um, but on a satin border, you don't really have much control over the satin angles. Um, in addition, if you wanted other stitch types like um, like a complex fill instead of a satin for your your edging, um, you might want to do that or you have to do that with an area. So you can create an area from a line. Um, this area, or I'm sorry, this satin stitch is four millimeters wide, so I want to keep that in mind. Um, so with that line, right click selected, if I go up to my view outline, which is right here, left click on view outline. I can then go up to outline and create area from line. When I do so, it asks me how wide do I want that area to be. I'll type in four here and then press OK. It's going to create the best fit area for the line right on top of it. So now it created an area from that stemming from the center of that line. I'm going to change the color Let's see, we need a, a totally different color. Press OK. And now this is an area. So I have a line 
underneath that area. So I'd have to delete that line. So here is that line. I'll left click to select it and then control delete. Now with this, I can go in and I can go in and I can go to my stitch properties and I can change it to a totally different fill type if I want. So if I wanted it to be a complex fill, I could certainly do that. Press OK and now it's a complex fill. Whereas this one is still a line. If I go to my stitch properties, it now says line object stitch properties. I cannot go in there and change it to a um, complex fill. Um, so there are benefits of having a line versus an area. It just all kind of depends on what you want. I'm going to change it back to a satin. And again, with the satin, um, I can control the angles. So if I go to view angle, I can see all my angles of my satin stitches and I can control those. But with the line, if I left click on that, I can't control those angles. Uh, those are 90 degrees to the line. So, you know, it all depends on, again, on what you want. You can even, with a line or with an area, you could even go in here and split the area. If I go into my outline view, I right click inside the area for the second time and divide with line. And let's say I just want to go all the way across and I want to make half of it blue and half of it orange. Press escape to get out of the tool. I have a top half which I'll make uh, orange. And then I have the bottom half, which I'll make the blue. So you can even do that. So there's lots of different things that you can do depending upon if you have a line or an area. With a line, it's not so easy to divide um, because it is an, it's, it's not a closed shape. Uh, whereas with an area, you can certainly do that. So it looks like we got another question. Um, so can you create a zigzag stitch? Yes, you absolutely can create a zigzag stitch. Um, with, with it on a line, um, let's go ahead and turn everything, uh, let's turn the tack down invisible. Um, with creating a zigzag stitch, you usually don't want the tack down because you're gonna see it underneath. So with this selected, this is a line, I'll go to my stitch settings and I will go to the satin tab here. Um, actually, before I do that, I want to deselect use underlay. We do not want an underlay because uh, again, you're going to see that. We're going to go to the satin tab here and we're going to use a zigzag stitch style, which is kind of the more of the style for the tackle twill. We do not want auto stitch shortening and we want to open the density up. So I'm going to open the density up to two before it's 0.4, so I'm opening up to 2, and I'll hit Apply. And I'll go ahead and move that over, press OK, and right-click off to the side. Now you can see, um, and actually I'm going to turn that uh, placement stitch invisible, but you can see that we have now an open tackle twill type of stitch. The thing is, is that I have this running stitch or this traveling stitch right in here. So I need to move my in and out points. A lot of times I need to move them where they're right next to each other. Um, so that just goes around in one, you know, one circle. And then I'll generate, I'm sorry, let me undo that just for a second. To move your in and out points when you're right clicked on the area, you'll take the in point, put your cursor over it. It's a four way arrow and you can left click, hold and drag. And then I'll hit go right click off to the side. Okay, that's still not using it, doing it properly. Sometimes I will play around with this a little bit. Oops. And hit go, right click off to the side. And there we go, there we have that nice open stitch. Um, in doing it on an area, if we right click on the area, we go to the stitch settings. Again, we want to deselect, use underlay, and we're going to do the same thing. We go to the satin tab, use the zigzag stitch style, deselect auto stitch shortening, and open up the density to two. I'll go ahead and hit OK. And now we have, um, we have that open stitch. The thing is, is that what we see is the 
uh, tact, or I'm sorry, the pla placement stitch. We can also change our angles. Uh, I'm in the angle view. That's just left clicking on view angle. And if I want to change those angles I, or add more angles, I can go to add stitch direction guideline. And I just right clicked again inside that area. Um, I want to make more straight angles. Whoops. Right click inside the area, add stitch direction guideline. And all I'm doing is left clicking, holding, and dragging. Going all the way across. And I'm creating new angles here. Right click to deselect or press escape and hit go. And now you've got, um, you know, the, those angles look a little bit better as far as your, your satin stitch goes. So sometimes when you're doing it on a line or on an area, it is difficult to get the, um, you know, so that you don't see an, uh, a traveling stitch. So sometimes what I will do, and let's go ahead and bring in that same D. And I'm just going to create an outline. I just deleted the inside D here. And we will go here. We got a satin border. I'll go to my settings. We'll go to uh, no underlay. We'll go to the line tab. Change that satin width to four. We'll go to satin here. Deselect auto stitch shortening. Use the zigzag stitch style and up the density. And I'll go ahead and hit OK. And um, we just want to make sure that we don't get the, uh, the traveling stitch. So again, we do have to select the area and sometimes play with our in and out points. And if um, sometimes it's necessary to divide the areas up, so if we go to our outline view and outline uh, create area from line, I'll make this a different color. And then I'm going to actually, I have to ungroup it because I'm going to pull this aside. So Take this D, oops, let's zoom in on these guys. And with it selected, again, I'll go to my stitch settings, satin, deselect auto stitch shortening, change that to two, go to basic, deselect underlay, and apply, and OK. Um, let's change that to a darker color so we can really see that. So, you know, sometimes in playing with my in and out points, I may not find that um, area where it will uh, not have any traveling stitches. This kind of gives me a clue here. If you can see where it kind of uh, stems from here and here. Um, I can take that out point here, end point here, see if that works. No, that didn't work. So sometimes what I do with an area is I'll go in, view outline, outline, divide with line, and maybe I'll just do this right here. Uh, actually, let's do it right here. It's a little bit easier to see. Now it's not completely divided where it's two shapes or two pieces, like the one on the left-hand side here, but it is one shape with a division line right in the middle. Press escape to get out of the tool. I'll hit go. So now what I can do is I can put my out point on one side of that division line, my end point on the other side of that division line. And now, you know, it's kind of going around like a snake. It's got a head and tail just like a snake at that division line. You know, maybe I can move those a little bit closer together. Oh, too close. So I can play with it a little bit. And so that it does not have that stitch 
um, that, um, sorry, the uh, travel stitch underneath there. Um, you know, again, it can be playing with the in and out points, or it may be that you have to actually um, divide the areas up so that it goes in one direction, so it's not traveling underneath, so you don't see those um, stitches underneath. So, um, hope that answered the question there. Um, and it looks like, um, so that's what I wanted to cover with you guys on the applique. Uh, and of course, if you do have more questions, you know, please email me or give me a call and I'm, I'm happy to help. Um, this will be up on our YouTube channel and I'll send you guys the link too. So, um, I'm going to leave it open for a couple minutes just to see if anybody has any questions and I'm going to keep recording. Um, so if you do have any questions, go ahead and type them in the question box. And again, thanks, uh, thanks a lot for coming. Um, I really appreciate it. And next time we're going to go a little bit more in depth as far as uh, designing or working with images that are not so great, some kind of real life excuse me, some, you know, some real life uh, situations here. Um, oh, I apologize. We, uh, Jackie, that was my fault. Um, we didn't talk about putting it onto the machine. So when we load the design onto the machine on the ZSK as a, um, you know, as a DST file, you load it in, and when you get to the optimization screen where you're inputting your needles, you will input the same needle for each step, the placement, tack down, and cover. But when you input that, that color change, you also have to input a stop. So color one, let's go back to that ZSK design. So we'll go, We had it here. So with the ZSK design, color one is going to be the placement, color two will be the tack down, and color three will be the cover stitch. So you will input the same needle for one, two, and three. But you want the um, machine to stop before needle or the before the second color. So before uh, step number two. In step number two. After you input your needle, you'll arrow back up to that color. And you will, there's a button at the bottom that uh, allows you to select more, um, more than just the, the needle numbers. And in there, there's a little stop sign with a plus. And when you click on that, it'll um, put a little plus sign next to your needle number and that indicates a stop before that color starts. So you'll input that for two and three. And we have that, let me go ahead and pull up that, that video. Just give me a second. create a stunning website. Well, I've already done it with Wix. Let me show you how it's done. All right, let me pause this for you. Um, so this shows you where we would go in and insert the image. And I'm just going to fast forward to the um, to the insert stop functions. And here, um, I actually have to turn my volume off because otherwise it's going to mess me up. Um, here, when we input the three different colors, so we have one, two, and three. We have our placement stitch, 
tack down stitch and cover stitch. So here we input all three as far as what needle we want to stitch. We'll arrow back up to needle two or the second one because we want it to stop before that second one. So the first one's the placement stitch, the second one is the tack down, and the third one is the cover. So we want it to stop before the second uh, section. So we'll arrow down to needle two, and then there's a more button next to our needles at the bottom. And if you press that, uh, you'll see at the bottom of the screen, there's a little stop sign with a plus and it puts a little plus next to the number three, and that indicates a stop. So you'll also do that for the cover stitch, and then after you do that, you'll accept that stop table. So that's how you would input it and make sure there are stops um, in that design. Um, with that too, there's also, uh, we call it the applique button, but let me get a better shot of the screen. Uh, it's it's kind of hard to see in here, but you have the right side and the left side of your controller. The right side of your controller is where you can um, start and stop, and then you also have the ZSK button. When you press that ZSK button, that light will switch over to the panograph side, and on the panograph side, that's where you can move your panograph. Um, so when you are doing applique after the placement stitch, if you press the ZSK button, move the panograph, out so you can lay that fabric down. After you lay that fabric down, you can press and hold the blue button in the center of those four arrows. Um, when you press and hold that blue button, it will go back to the last position. After you do that, press the ZSK button again and hit start, and then you can start your stitching again. Um, so what I'll do is I will include this little link in the email that I send out. Um, and, but that's how you would do it on the ZSK machine. Let's see. So we have another question here about um, the best font to use for small lettering. We did have a webinar on small lettering um, that would be good to revisit if you haven't visited yet. Um, but with small lettering, you typically want to do with fonts that are easy to read, you know, block fonts. Um, script fonts are harder to read and the reason is is because one it's it's small but two it's also going to you know your the little the lowercase e's and the lowercase a's those openings kind of have a tendency to close up so utilizing a font that is block with no serifs and things like that that's usually the best um, as far as fonts go um, but think the webinar that went over the small lettering was uh, the it was between a couple different webinars so um, I would revisit the the uh, playlist for the webinars and kind of go over that uh, but of course if you do have questions just just let me know so if you if you don't have any questions, um, you'll, you're free to leave, I guess. Uh, if you do, you know, I'm, I'm going to stick around for a couple of minutes, see if we do have any more questions. Looks like we do have another question. Uh, actually, not a question, but thanks, thank you uh, to you guys. Um, I appreciate it again. It doesn't look like we do have any more questions. I'm going to stop the recording, and uh, but I will stick around for a couple of minutes. <laughs> 